in most classes, you're not used to actually learning anything. That's why this is new. But it's good. You're learning something, right, guys? Aren't you? You're learning not to take me for another class ever again. Here we go. No, that's it. I don't teach anything. All I do is relay information. Here we go. Where are my glasses? Anybody see them? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. So I did, I did 11 and I did 12. Say yeah. I did 15, yes. I did that. That's applying Starling's Law, right? Why are you, yes or no? Okay. All right. So I did the circulation of blood through the heart. Now I'm going to describe the electrical conduction of the heart. And that will take us into several different questions. All of these questions, of course, are related. All right, ready? Here we go. Watch. Watch. The heart is unique. The heart, number one, can generate generate its own electrical impulses. Yes, it can. Got me? Not only can it generate its own electrical impulses, but it can sustain that electrical activity. And it can reproduce it. So, like on a to-do list, you would say, read the textbook and have more than one heartbeat each day. Right? So, the heart is able to generate its own electrical activity, sustain that electrical activity, and then reproduce its own electrical activity. Right? Now, if you were to rip out somebody's heart out of their chest, it would continue to beat. Why? Because it has its own electrical activity. Watch. Because of that, that allows people to get a heart transplant. If the heart wasn't able to generate and sustain its own electrical activity, you would have to remove the heart, the spinal cord, and the brain of that person and transplant it into the person who needed that heart. The problem with that is that you would have a completely different person, right? And it may be a killer or, worse yet, a person who did not read the textbook. And you don't even want to go there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you the electrical conduction of the heart. Then I'm going to incorporate number 19 into it, the EKG at the same time. Here we go. Only one other person has been able to do that. Me and Arthur Guyton, who wrote the textbook of medical physiology. That's it. So, I'm in rarefied air over here. Are you ready? Watch. The electrical conduction system of the heart is made up of a group of specialized cardiac cells that do not contract, but rather produce electrical impulses. And the normal pacemaker of the heart is called the sinoatrial node abbreviated SA note. So if you have ever heard a doctor or a nurse say, this patient's in sinus rhythm, have you ever heard of that? That means that the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. Now, you better write this down, better not pout. I'm telling you why, yeah? Heart cells are unique. So if I were to show you two heart cells. They're not square, but I'm doing that for purposes of edification. 
individual heart cells are connected by these little tunnels called gap junctions. This is very important that you get this. Gap junctions electrically connect individual heart cells. What gap junctions do specifically is they allow the instantaneous spread of electrolytes from one heart cell to the next. So even though the heart, the atria, and the ventricles are made of millions and millions of individual cells, electrically, they act as one giant cell. And that is because of gap junctions. So when one cell produces an electrical impulse, it will travel instantly over all of the other muscle cells, the heart muscle cells, because of gap junctions, right? You don't want that in your bicep. You don't want your bicep to contract maximally all the time, right? You try picking a booger and you give yourself a lobotomy. You don't want that. So, but you don't want parts of your heart to take a day off, right? That would be bad for you. So gap junctions electrically connect heart cells together so that they function as a unit. Then you have this another, other feature called intercalated discs. I'll write that out. Can you see this? Oh, yeah. This is a great color. Intercalated discs discs and intercalated discs mechanically tie individual heart cells together so think of a bunch of people playing tug of war you got 20 people on one side and 20 on the other even though they're individual people the rope ties them together so they function as a unit so gap junctions allow the heart cells to be electrically connected and intercalated discs allow the heart cells to be mechanically connected. So when the electrical impulse travels over all the heart cells, they contract as a unit. Say yes. Good. So watch. What's the normal pacemaker of the heart? The SA node. The SA node. Now, do you want the atria to contract before at the same time or after the ventricles? Before, you want the atria to contract before the ventricles. Why? You want the atria to send that additional 25% of the blood into the ventricles. So you better write this down. There is a little rubber washer that separates the atria from the ventricle. It is actually part of the cardiac cytoskeleton. Basically what this tissue does is it electrically insulates the atria from the ventricles. So when the electrical impulses are put, are, are being spread through the atria, this little rubber washer prevents those electrical impulses from going directly to the ventricle. Say yes. So that's good. So here we go. Now watch. I want this whole thing. Ready? I'm explaining to you the electrical conduction system of the heart. What separates the atria from the ventricles? The little rubber washer. Say, yeah. What's the pacemaker of the heart? The SA node. So the SA node will produce an electrical impulse. And when it produces that electrical impulse, it will spread instantly over both the right and left atria. Why? Because of gap junctions. Are you with me? Then once the electrical activity is spread over both atrial cells, it will cause the atria to contract. Now, if you hook somebody up with electrodes, you can actually see the electrical activity going on in the atria. 
and you see this little blip. And that little blip is called the P wave. And the P wave represents the electrical activity in the atria or atrial depolarization or the atria producing electrical impulses. Say yes. Now, do you want that impulse that was generated in the FSA node to go directly to the ventricles? No. What stops that electrical impulse from traveling directly to the ventricles? The little rubber washer, kind of like the little rubber ducky. Rubber ducky, you're the one. You make bath time lots of fun. Rubber ducky, I'm awfully fond of you. <laughs> when I squeeze you, you make noise. I can tell nobody's listening. But I don't care. You know why, Jimmy? Oh, I'm getting paid. Here we go. Watch. Those electrical imp oh, that's the eraser. Those electrical impulses that were produced by the SA node cannot get to the ventricles because of the little rubber washer. Instead, all of those electrical impulses are funneled into the next portion of the electrical conduction system, which is called the AV node or atrial ventricular node. Now, in the AV node, there is an electrical delay. That impulse sits there just for a split second. The purpose of that impulse sitting there for a split second is to allow the atria to contract and push that additional blood into the ventricle. All right. Who's following so far? Now let's get rid of the rubber washer just for a second. So now you have the impulse in the AV node. The next portion of the electrical conduction system is the AV bundle or bundle of hiss. And the AV bundle or bundle of hiss, in women it's called the bundle of her. Okay. Now watch, this is important. The AV bundle then splits into the left bundle branch. and the right bundle branch. Jonathan, you've probably heard of people having a left bundle branch block. You've heard of that? Jamie, you've probably heard of that? Or an RBB. Or an RBB. Yeah, you know me, right? Now, watch. So that impulse from the bundle of hiss will travel to the left bundle and then the right bundle at the same time. And then the right and left bundle both bifurcate and fasciculate. Very good terms. Thank you. Into what are called the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers then carry that electrical impulse to both the right and left ventricles. So you have the right bundle branch that branches into Purkinje fibers, and then the left bundle branch that branches into Purkinje fibers. Who's following this? All right, so watch. Hang on. Now, if we look, this is important. What do we have so far on the EKG? You had a P wave, then you had a little delay. When the impulse travels through the bundle of hiss, the left and right bundle branch at the same time, and then finally the Purkinje fibers of both the right and left ventricle, on the EKG, it produces the QRS. And the QRS represents ventricular depolarization, or 
the electrical activity within both ventricles. Now, what produces that electrical activity? Electrolytes. So anytime you have an electrolyte abnormality, then you always worry about your EKG. And a lot of times you will see um, electrolyte abnormalities in the EKG. More on that later or following the news at 10. Now, watch. When the electrolytes move in and out of cardiac cells to produce depolarization, your hope is, is that you can reset those electrolytes again so that you can do it all over again. So P wave is atrial depolarization. The QRS is ventricular depolarization. And you want to be able to reset the electrolytes in the ventricles to do it all over again so you finally get the T wave. And the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Ventricular re repolarization. Right. Um, um, it's potentially bad, but um, I'll show you. I'll show you some of the things that can happen with uh, EKGs. Just so you know, every summer I teach a free, by the way, free um, three-week, nine-hour, uh, twelve-lead EKG class, where I can teach you how to read a twelve-lead with one eye tied behind your back. I'm not even kidding. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lakers, the chief of cardiology uh, for Advocate Medical Group out of Lutheran General Hospital. I thought he was the smartest guy ever. So anyways, I had this pile of EKGs, about 312 leads. And I'm looking, I'm like, that's a right bundle branch box. That's an inferior wall am I. And he called me Forrest Gump. He goes, Forrest, what are you doing? I go, I'm trying to remember, memorize these EKGs. And he goes, how many you got there? I go, about 300. He goes, here's 301. You don't do it that way. So in 20 minutes, he explained to me the electrical conduction system through the heart and how it worked and what the leads look at, the electrodes that you put on, look at it. And I learned how to read a 12 lead. So I can pick up a 12 lead now and I can tell you what's wrong with that person. Right? Watch. Um, and I actually lost a little respect for the guy. And here's why. Because I thought, that guy is so smart. And then when I learned how to do it, I realized I'm not that bright. And I thought, maybe he's not that bright either. Did you ever think about that? OK, watch. I want this in your answer if you want to get full credit. Or what I will do is I will make up multiple choice questions about this to make sure that you get them wrong. Now watch. Better write this down. I'm not even kidding. I want this somewhere. The first part of the ventricle to depolarize, to produce its electrical activity, is the um, ventricular septum. And the ventricular septum always depolarizes left to right. Are you following that? The left bundle branch depolarizes the intraventricular septum. Then the Purkinje fibers depolarize the right and left ventricle, and it's always endo to epi, inside of the heart to out, and apex to base. Endo to epi, apex to base. The narrowest part of an organ is the apex. The widest part is the base. So the impulse, the first part of the ventricle to contract is the intraventricular septum. So it will contract and it will pull both of the ventricles up. Then it depolarizes apex to base so the heart when it contracts it goes up 
and like this. And that guarantees that that blood's going to be injected into the pulmonary trunk and into the aorta. It's a uh, endo to epi apex. The base. What's the first part of the ventricle to depolarize? Well, that sounds like a good multiple choice question. That sounds like a good multiple choice question. And how does it depolarize, Jonathan? Left to right. It depolarizes left to right. And how did the right and left ventricle depolarize? Tatiana? Tatiana said it depolarizes endo to epi and apex to base. That's very good, Tatiana. That's there forever. <laughs> Tell me you got that, guys. So when you look at an EKG, what's this? What does that represent? Atrial depolarization, right? Then you have a little delay. What's the function of the delay? And where is that delay occurring? I'm waiting. Russ? Uh, it's getting ready for the Where's it sitting? Uh, AV In the AV node, though. The AV node produces that little delay. Then it travels through the bundle of his, left and right bundle branch, and then finally, the Purkinje fibers of both the right and left ventricle, and that produces the what? Boom. And that's ventricular depolarization. And then you want the electrolytes to reset, and that produces the T wave, and both ventricles resetting. Say yes. Why don't you see the atria resetting? Why don't you see atrial repolarization? Watch. What am I doing right now? What am I doing right now? What am I doing to you guys right now? Can you tell what I'm doing to you right now? Huh? You can't? Could you guess? What do you think I'm doing? Do you think I'm flipping you off? I'm not, see, I had to, right? And you couldn't tell because my hand was in the way. So you better write this down. Sounds like a multiple choice question. Tatiana? The ventricles are depolarizing at the same time the atria are repolarizing. So the QRS blocks the ability to see atrial repolarization on the EKG. Did you follow that? Did you follow that? <laughs> Ventricular depolarization is happening at the same time that the atria are repolarizing. That's why you don't see a wave for atrial repolarization. Tell me you got that. That's why you couldn't tell that I what I was doing behind my hand, right? Whether I was flipping you off or not, and I wasn't. I have the index finger. Guys, say yes. You followed us. Yeah or no? Okay, watch. Watch. Do you need your atria to contract to live? Can you live without your atria not contracting? Um, yes. Yes, you would just want to keep it. Right. How does the blood get from the atria to the ventricle? How does the majority of the blood get from the atria to the ventricle? Pressure. Changes in pressure. Only 25% or so 
goes from the atria into the ventricle when the atria physically contract. Have you ever heard of a condition called atrial fibrillation? The atria don't contract, they quiver. Say, yeah. So grandma or grandpa got a little touch of the atrial fib. They're not going to be leaping, you know, pole vaulting, but they may be able to go to, uh, I don't know, Cousin Goober's house, have a cup of joe, play some banjo. Then they can ambulate home. Not very well, though. And watch, watch, watch. People with atrial fibrillation always take what? That's right. Because what does blood do that doesn't move? That's why when the atria don't contract, some blood can pool in the atria and they can form clots, and sometimes those clots can break off. That's why they're on anticoagulants. Jonathan's a rock star. Yeah, dude, you're a rock star, man. How many people got that? Better watch. What are the three potential pacemakers of the heart? We know one of them. What is it? The eight. No. The SA node. And the intrinsic rate of the SA node, the intrinsic firing of the SA node, is between 60 and 80 beats per minute. It fires at an intrinsic rate of 60 to 80 times per minute. That's why the normal heart rate is between 60 and 80. Say yeah. If the SA node takes a dump, what becomes the pacemaker? The AV node. What's the intrinsic rate of the AV node? 40 to 60. If the SA node and the AV node take a dump, what becomes pacemaker? And what's the intrinsic rate of the Purkinje fibers? That's right. Can you live with a heart rate of 15? Yeah, you'd be like this. Maybe that's it. You guys need pacemakers. 15 to 30. Don't you think Purkinje fibers would be a good name for a rock group? It's here for Purkinje fibers. Elizabeth, what do you think about Purkinje fibers? They're great. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> Are you, you're thinking about naming your rock group Purkinje fibers. Sure. Yeah? Well, fine, you'd be that way. I'll sue you in court. I thought of it first. <laughs> right. Watch. Watch. If can someone live with a heart rate of fifteen? No. no. So if your SA node takes a crap and your AV node takes a crap, then your Purkinje fibers become the pacemaker, right? And you have what's called complete heart block. Have you ever heard of complete heart block? Now you know the definition. Again, I'm giving myself a high five. The education continues. All right, now watch. Those people need a permanent pacemaker. Where did the pacer wires go in a permanent pacemaker? Emily, get this right. And I'm not even kidding. What about the left atrial left ventricle? Why? Was that in the video? Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Thanks. Placed in the right atria, pacer wire, right ventricle, boom. 
and because of gap junctions and intercalated disc, when the right side is stimulated electrically, the left side will be stimulated, say, yeah. Did it, in the video, did I tell you about the, the twi twiddler syndrome? I don't think so. Do you know what that is? I don't know either. Watch. When you get something new, what do you want to do? Play with it. Play with it. So when people get a pacemaker, they want to play with it. So they'll be watching Judge Judy or Judge Joe Brown, Tatiana, and they will start twisting the pacemaker underneath their skin. And it will pull out the pacer wires. So they're, while they're watching Judge Joe Brown, I have, this is a good episode. And they start twisting it. They pull the pacer wire. And I'm like, hey. That's called Twiddler syndrome. Watch. I think I'm making this up. You don't know. I could be making it up. I think that's good. Well, what the hell is that? Oh, well, there's a pacer wire. There we go. Twid. Uh, I saw that Twiddler's syndrome. Here it is. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Look. Pulled out the pace wires. <laughs> see? Wrapped up. Look at that. Did I ever tell you that story about the guy golfing? He had an in, um, automatic internal defibrillator. Did I ever tell you about that? And he was going to tee off. Me and my buddy were waiting to tee off. And he goes like this. About to tee off, he goes. <clears throat> and then he goes to his buddy, oh, I just got one. And I go, got one what? He goes, oh, I got one of them there internal defibrillators. I go, can we play through? Because if he goes down and I'm behind him, I have to stop. But if I'm in front of him, I never saw him. The education continues. See, yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot. I usually tell you, tell you this one, but I'm going to tell you this one. Okay, watch. Watch. Are you watching? I think Tatiana, she's not watching. Jonathan, keep an eye on her, huh? Okay, ready? Watch. When people have mitral valve problems, mitral valve prolapse, or mitral valve regurgitation, right? The valve, the mitral valve's jacked up. The mitral valve is in close proximity to the electrical conduction system of the heart. So people with mitral valve problems develop very, very fast heart rates. So they can just be sitting there and all of a sudden their heart rate will just shoot up. You got me? And that can produce uh, anxiety. So um, they have mitral valve support groups where you can go and talk about your mitral valve problems. Hi, I'm Timmy. I have mitral valve prolapse. What are you supposed to say? Hi, Timmy. Hey. I'm making that up. Wait, mitral valve. See, mitral valve support groups. Heart valve disease. Connect with people like me. Let's go. Maybe they have a virtual... Uh... There we go. Oh, look. Look at all the lovely people you can meet. There's a lady. She got mitral valve prolapse. She had surgery. Yeah. There's aortic aneurysm. Oh, he must be a big group favorite. Yeah. Top that. Aortic aneurysm. You got mitral valve prolapse. You got nothing. All right. I did the electrical conduction system of the heart. Say, yeah. All right, here we go. I'm going to do this one, then you can ambulate home. You better watch those videos. Watch. I'm telling you right now, if you don't watch the video on the cardiac action potential, it's going to end poorly for you. That question is going to be on there. Do you understand? It's going to be on there. That question, I think, is number seven. It says... How does the heart generate and sustain its own electrical activity? Emily, are you believing me? I got two thumbs up from Emily. 
Elizabeth, you believe me? Two potentially covered by a sleeve. Thumbs up. Tell me you got that. All right, here we go. I'm going to do this and you're going to ambulate. Is the heart, the myocardium alive? Is the myocardium alive? Yes or no? Yeah, you got something dead in there. That's beating. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Oh, Lord. Okay, here we go. Watch. What supplies oxygenated blood to the heart muscle? Emily, get this right. Just read that. Just read that. The coronary arteries, that's very good. How many coronary arteries do you have? Emily. Two. Two, very good. It's the right and left main coronary artery. You better write this down. I'm not writing it down. I refuse to. The coronary artery openings originate at the base of the aorta. The coronary artery openings originate at the base of the aorta. What kind of blood is pumped into the aorta? What kind? Say it. Oxygenated. Here we go. Watch. What appears to be a 1950s style brazier represents the aortic valve. Now, when the left ventricle contracts, in order for it to eject oxygenated blood to the cells of the body, the aortic valve must open. Here are the openings to the coronary arteries. So when the left ventricle contracts and sends oxygenated blood to the cells of the body, the aortic valve opens and occludes, blocks the opening to the coronary arteries. Are you following this? Boom. So no blood flow goes through the coronary arteries when the left ventricle is contracting. But what are the two things that muscle can do, Tatiana? Contract and Very good. She didn't even move her lips there, and I heard it. <laughs> Relax. So when the left ventricle relaxes, the backflow pressure of blood in the aorta snaps the aortic valve closed and reveals the openings to the coronary arteries, and oxygenated blood will flow into the coronary arteries. So the heart muscle itself, the myocardium, receives its oxygenated blood during ventricular diastole. Don't write that, because I know you like, guys like to go ventricular diastole. You're going to explain how it receives its blood during ventricular diastole. Say yes. Say yes. Now watch. Watch. Okay, watch. Are you watching? If this artery, this coronary artery, had cholesterol buildup in it, right, what would happen to the amount of oxygenated blood that would be flowing through that artery? Would it be less or more? Less, right? So if you look at somebody and they're not in chest having chest pain, can you look at them and tell that they have blockages in their coronary arteries? No. So what they do is they make the person work hard. Now watch. Can you see this? Yeah. It's 
oxygen demand for the heart has to equal oxygen supply. And the coronary arteries supply that. You got me? Now watch. If the demand, if the demand for oxygen in the heart goes up, O2 demand goes up, and the coronary artery cannot supply that, right? Decrease supply, you get chest pain. Tell me you got that. Now watch. When does the heart muscle itself receive its oxygenated blood? When the heart is what? It, when it's relaxed. So if you want to see if somebody may have blockages in their coronary arteries, what you do is you give them a stress test. So the stress test increases the demand, the amount of oxygen the heart is demanding, and to see if the coronary arteries can supply all that oxygen. And if they can't supply it, then you have, you better write this down, when you cannot supply enough oxygenated blood to the heart muscle, the heart muscle becomes ischemic. Have you ever heard that term before? Ischemia means lack of blood flow. What carries the oxygen? Blood. If you lack blood flow, you're going to lack oxygen. And when you cut off oxygen to a part of the body, the first thing that happens to that part is you get pain. That's why you get chest pain. Ouch. Tell me you followed that. Yes or no? It makes perfect sense. And the reason a stress test works is watch. Watch. What happens to your heart rate when you're exercising? So if this is when your left ventricle is contracting, where in this picture is the, are the coronary arteries sending blood to the myocardium? Where? In between. So watch. If you increase your heart rate, what do you do to the time that the coronary arteries are sending blood to the heart muscle? you decrease it. And if there's a blockage in that coronary artery, that will be revealed on an EKG. That's how a stress test is used to look for heart disease. Say yes. And these terms you need to know, just real quick. Ischemia, lack of blood flow. Infarct is death. So if you have a myocardial infarct, your heart muscle is dead. And know this, dead heart muscle does not get better. Are you writing that down? Just like if you have a dead relative, do they get better? No. Tell me you got that. Uh, well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you, so be prepared. Uh, watch. I'm, I'm just going to tell you this, and I'll show you it on Tuesday. Watch. Okay. P, Q, R, S, right, and T wave. You got me? On an EKG, you have the baseline. 
You got me? This part right here, it's called the ST segment. The ST segment is particularly sensitive to lack of blood flow. And if the ST segment drops below the baseline, ST segment depression, that's a sign of ischemia, lack of blood flow. If the ST segment goes above the baseline, so it looks something like this, you've got your P wave, then you got your QR, and it looks something like that, that's called, and here's the baseline, that's called ST segment elevation. ST segment elevation is a sign of a complete blockage of a coronary artery and if that person's having a heart attack and that part of the heart's going to die. So you probably heard the term um, STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarct. ST depression, ischemia, ST elevation, infarct. So if you see this, this ST segment depression, all right, tell the doctor. If you see this, you better scream for Dr. Galakowicz because this person is in trouble. Say yeah. And part of the heart that controls the electrical conduction system, the artery that supplies that is called the left anterior descending artery, or better known as the widow maker. And the left anterior descending artery supplies oxygenated blood to the electrical conduction system. So if that becomes blocked with a blood clot, then the electrical conduction system gets jacked up and the person goes into ventricular fibrillation. So the most common cause of sudden cardiac death following a heart attack is not death of heart muscle. It's damage to the electrical conduction system and ventricular fibrillation. So people die from sudden cardiac death not from death of heart muscle, but from arrhythmia. That's why out there, when they, they go into ventricular fibrillation, you hook up a defibrillator. And the defibrillator actually shocks the heart, stops the heart, with the hope that the electrolytes reset and start beating normally. The education continues. Say, so, yeah. Now you can go back to the docs and you can talk to them. Yeah, you know, you, I, that guy's got a STEMI. There you go. Sorted. Yeah, that's ven oh, that's ventricular fibrillation. Yeah, you don't want that. Okay, guys, you can ambulate home now. Uh, could you guys do me a favor and study? Huh?